Well, I'm really thrilled to get the chance to talk with you all today. Um, I, I, I spend a lot of my time in tutorial lectures talking about the process of protein identification, and I thought it would be nice for a change to shift to something that's a little more advanced in protein identification. So today we'll be talking about one of the most uh, important activities that we use for clinical proteomics, where we search for post-translational modifications. I'm going to get this water open early. Perfect. Okay, so, uh, oh, slides? here we go. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about analytical chemistry, simply because we have to. Uh, if we're going to understand how we uh, develop data sets that are useful for post-translational post modifications, it's certainly very important what kind of analytical chemistries happened up front to enable that. Next, we'll talk about the most common strategy that people use for post-translational modification hunting. That's the, uh, the use of database search algorithms. And from there, we'll talk about a more advanced technique um, called line modification searching that we do by sequence tagging. From there, we're going to talk about two of the major, uh, the major errors that people fall into when dealing with post-translational modifications because anytime PTMs come into play, and I'm going to use the abbreviation PTMs because it's an awful mouthful to, to say post-translational modification every time, uh, we, we have two problems that we continually run into with post-translational modifications, localization, uh, trying to pin down where within a peptide a modification is taking place, and also the higher false discovery rates that we encounter because we've included post-translational modifications in our searches. So let us start with the basic workflow. Uh, I think many people are accustomed to seeing this kind of workflow if you've worked in proteomics. This is shotgun or bottom-up proteomics, um, and it is the most common technique that people use out there. So we start with a protein mixture, the upper left, those protein mixtures are already quite complex. Most generally, we're working from, say, solid tissue, or uh, we're working from uh, cell lines. Uh, and then those, those mixtures have thousands of different proteins at very different concentrations. And one of the first things that we do is to make that mixture more complex by digesting it to peptides. Now, that step of digesting it to peptides is, is intended to ease the analytical chemistry downstream. We can separate and, and mass analyze peptides much more effectively than we can intact proteins. So this, uh, the process of starting with the peptide mixture then gives us the ability to do fractionation, especially for very complex samples. If you have fewer than 100 proteins in your sample, you don't need to go through the fractionation step. But if you've got more than that, you'll almost always see a pretty big benefit from making use of a technique like mud pit or gel CMS or basic reverse phase liquid chromatography and cooling. All of these methods are used here at Vanderbilt in some, some uh, shape or fashion. Once you've done that, the peptides have been separated out to these different, uh, to these different uh, pools, and, and you may have 12 vials or 24 vials, depending on how you did the, uh, the separation. All those epidorp tubes, each one is going to correspond to a single LC-MS-MS experiment. Now, LC-MS-MS is quite a few steps, and everything from the, kind of the red liquid chromatography diagram down to the uh, collecting fragments in tandem MS is included in that. So the liquid chromatography is going to separate a peptide sample in time so that we have lots of time for the mass spec to collect tandem mass spectra from peptides that are in those mixtures. You may have thousands of peptides there, so the mass spec is going to have its hands, its hands full trying to capture lots and lots of tandem mass spectra that reflect these peptides from the mixture. Uh, the peptides that are leaving the reverse phase column are electrosprayed, which means that they're, they're getting something like three to 5,000 volts applied to them, which causes them to explode out into this, this uh, plume of ions. And those ions are then brought into the vacuum environment of the mass spectrometer. The mass spec is going to measure each peptide two different ways. Uh, and those are reflected here by uh, the, the orbit trap over here at the very left and this tandem mass spectrum over at the very right. So a mass spectrum is not so very complex. It's essentially an inventory. What ions are present here uh, using intensity uh, kind of as a, as a proxy for concentration, more or less, and the, the x-axis represents the mass to charge ratio of those ions. So this, this snapshot that comes at a particular moment in time tells us which ions are available for analysis. And the instrument chooses on the basis of the signals it sees in mass spectrometry which ions are going to be isolated for tandem mass spectrometry. So a particular peptide ion, say everything close to 786.4, is isolated in the, in the trap. And then we uh, cause that ion to bounce off of gas molecules. This causes it to rise in temperature until it undergoes fragmentation. 
Uh, that's usually the process that we use. It's called collision-induced dissociation. But collisions with gases, uh, with gas molecules, these peptide ions break apart to form fragment ions. Those fragments then can be measured in tandem mass spectrometry. So where the mass spectrum is collecting uh, the, the parts list, essentially, which peptide ions are available at this moment in time, the tandem mass spectrometry is capturing the fragments that are produced when a particular peptide ion breaks. So mass spectrometry, tandem mass spectrometry, two sources of information. So this methodology is great when you're just trying to do shot vetting and trying to develop large protein inventories. But when you are trying to do post-translational modifications, it really helps you a lot if you can enrich for a particular class of modification. So one of the most common methods that we see is the immobilized metal, ion, uh, metal affinity col uh, column, or IMAC column. Uh, sometimes these are like titanium dioxide columns, sometimes you'll see uh, iron-based columns. But they, they function basically by a, a charge, uh, charge proclivity for these, uh, these phosphorylated peptides. The phosphorylated peptides are more likely to stick to the, the, metal, line, uh, the metal of these columns. And as a result, we're able to pull preferentially the phosphopeptides from the mixture apart from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the peptides in that mixture. Okay, so um, I, need to, I need to point out that I do consulting works for Sigma. I, I'm citing them here simply because they make a column uh, and had a nice figure that we could borrow for it. All right, so CME credits have been uh, taken care of here. And I want to point out one other thing. Uh, a lot of people, when they are doing uh, IMAC columns like this, are, uh, are really trying to find uh, phospopeptides, and they don't care so much about the other peptides that might be present in the mixture. As a result, they may digest the proteins to peptides before they get to the IMAC column. And this rules out one of the most common rules that we use for figuring out which proteins have been identified in the sample. One of the things that we typically do is to say we only want to see those proteins for which multiple peptides were observed. But if you have used peptide capture, you no longer have that capability. Other peptides that might have been there have been washed out through the column. They went, to, went with the flow through. As a result, we have uh, some limitations on how we can analyze the data downstream. Now, it's not necessary that you use uh, metal columns for doing this, this kind of work if you want to do uh, a particular type of modification. In the case of phosphotyrosines, uh, we have antibodies made by cell signaling that are quite effective in capturing these out. And there are other uh, antibodies made out there as well, cell signaling just sort of popularized this practice. So if you're interested in signaling networks, you may not be interested in all phosphorylations. You may be more particularly interested in phosphotyrosines. So you also have the option of columns that are built around antibodies rather than metal affinity. And of course, you might be one of those crazy people out there who are interested in carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are a very intriguing place to be working uh, in mass spectrometry right now. And yet the information systems for tackling carbohydrates are quite a lot more challenging. So uh, we have the, the benefit of biology here that we can use antibodies uh, when I, I'm sorry, we, we, we talked about antibodies just a moment ago for phosphatyrosines, and here we can use proteins that recognize particular sugar moieties uh, uh, called lectins. These lectins in columns can pull aside uh, the peptides that, that bear these uh, glycosylation sites. Now, one of the things that we frequently see when people use this kind of column is that they're not trying to recognize much about the sugar itself. Instead, they want to know about the, uh, the places where sugars work. So if, you, uh, if, you're, if your interest is in knowing what specific sugar is attached to which type of protein, you don't really have the option of chopping all the sugars off to do that. But if your interest is in cataloging where sugars attach to proteins, you might use a column like this to attach the glycosylated peptides to the column, and then you might, chop, uh, you might free the peptides by using something called ENGASF that chops the peptide off of the sugar and uh, allows the peptides to, to be freed from the column. So, You'll find different kinds of strategies used depending on what kind of biochemical you're, you're analyzing. The other thing that I would mention is that collision-induced dissociation, kind of our standby for shotgun proteomics, is not always what we would use for post-translational modifications. Because a lot of times, you're interested in, uh, in uh, PTMs that fall off of the proteins really readily. Um, Oglipnac is a very common example of this. It's a carbohydrate PTM. Uh, another one that we work with all the time is phosphoserine and phosphothreonine. These are phosphorylations of, of proteins, and yet when you have a, phosphor, a phosphorylation on these two residues, 
the breakage of that phosphorylation off of the peptide can compete with the process by which we're breaking the peptides. As a result, that's, uh, that's an important challenge for us to deal with. Electron transfer dissociation gives us an alternative to collision-induced dissociation, whereby we break the peptides much more gently. And this gives us the ability to break peptide bonds preferentially and leave those PTMs intact. So those are the bits of analytical chemistry I wanted to talk about as a, as a preparation for how we're going to do PTM searching. Any questions so far before we move aside from, uh, from biochemistry? Okay, let's move ahead. So let's talk about the, the old standby. This approach has been in place since 1995. Um, and I would note that the, the use of database search algorithms for PTM searching came about really early in their evolution. You can see that the very first publication that used database search at all was 1994. And it was the year after that that post-translational modification hunting was published as, a, as an add-on to this field. So what you're looking at is a diagram of how database search engines like Sequest or Mascot or Xtandem or any number of other search engines that have been published. I, I did a quick count earlier this year and came up with more than 30 that have been published so far. So this is, a, this is one of those places where a new bioinformaticist coming into our field sort of says hello by publishing another database search engine. <laughs> I should know I've published two of them so far, so <laughs> I'm, I'm adding to that. Glad. So here we have uh, different sources of information that are all being used for identifying peptides. We start with the source of our sequences, which is the FASTA sequence database. So maybe you have a sequence database that contains every protein known to be in humans as your, as your source sequence database. You have the tandem mass spectrum, uh, where we have the fragments that we have seen for the particular peptide, and we have the precursor mass. We know the mass of the peptide that was used to create this tandem mass spectrum. So those are the three sources of information we have. The software is going to digest those protein sequences to peptides, emulating the behavior of trypsin. This is our most common enzyme used for, for digesting the proteins. We're going to have a PTM expander that causes the peptide sequences to be decorated with, uh, with post-translational modifications. We have a peptide mass filter that decides which decorated peptides are going to get compared to which spectra. Those are the candidate peptides, and for each candidate peptide, we're going to predict what the spectrum should look like if it were that peptide, and a match scorer that compares that predicted set of fragments to those that we actually observed. So you see that the tandem mass spectral data, the, the fragment ions that we see, are only used at the very last step of database search. Now, I want to point out a few things about how this expansion takes place. This is the process by which we decorate peptides with, with uh, post-translational uh, modifications. I'm using, uh, for my example, a peptide drawn from uh, uh, bo uh, bovine casein. This is a, a protein that we find in, in milk. Uh, and we see that in this case, we have two serines and a threonine all in this sequence. Now, when we do a, a phosphorylation search, when we're, when we're looking for phosphorylations in a data set, one of the things that we typically target would be the addition of a mass of 80, which is what phosphorylations weigh, uh, to serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So when you look at this peptide uh, in the context of PTM decoration, you see three modifiable sites. As a result, there are eight forms of this peptide that can arise. I've got three here in red. These represent the forms that have a single modification on board. We have these three, I think in, in blue here, uh, that are uh, colored with two modifications. And the final one that's modified in all three cases. <coughs> So I want you to imagine this peptide as a path through the woods. As you start walking through the woods, as you move through D, I, and G, there's just one path. But the minute you hit S, you've hit a split in the path. And you can go the direction of not modified, or you can go in the direction of modified. But as you continue on further down that path, you make it through another residue, no, no split in the path. But once you hit S again, you have another split in the path. So what started as just one way to walk through the woods has now split to eight different paths. This is the exponential growth of the search space as we add PTMs. So for each S, T, or Y residue, we have two possibilities. And in this case, we have three such residues in the, pe in the peptide. That means that there are two to the third, eight different ways that we can 
uh, it, it, that we can extrapolate from this peptide to find potential decorated peptides. So this is one of the things you should think about is that there are some peptides in this database for which there are no serines, no threonines, and no tyrosines. They don't get extrapolated at all because there are no modifiable sites. But the longer the peptide, the greater the chance that uh, the, the greater the, the number of modifiable sites, and thus the larger the number of times that we have to consider modifications here. Okay, so this is uh, going to have exponential cost because the more, the more candidates we generate, the more decorated peptide variants out there, the more species that we've got to compare to our spectra. And the greater the chance that a falsely, uh, a falsely derived peptide gets associated with the spectrum that might have a correct answer in the database. So this has some cost. It's going to cost us on sensitivity and cost us on specificity, and it's certainly going to cost us the time taken to get to our answer. Right. So here's a, a visual uh, of how much impact these searches can have. At the left, we are looking at all of the spectra collected in an LCMSMS experiment. This was on an LCQ, an old, old instrument, but the same holds true for the, the data we would collect today. And what we see is how many different candidate sequences we're going to compare to every spectrum. And you can see there's a fairly wide range of them at this low mass range. Uh, and as you get to higher and higher masses, we see that it tapers off some. There's kind of a typical number of, of uh, sequences that get compared to each. But there's no, uh, no rise in it, really, with mass. Once we add post-translational modifications, we see that the number of modifications that have to be considered rises by mass. So the longer peptides are going to get uh, compared to a lot more sequences than the shorter, uh, than the, the uh, less massive peptides. So that's that's pretty expensive, and it, and it reflects a an incongruity in how the data are analyzed. Small mass peptides have a much simpler time of identification than high mass peptides. The next thing is that you might be thinking, okay, well, I'll just use relatively few modifications. But, in fact, there are, uh, there are more factors at play than simply the total number of modifications. Because some amino acids are very, very frequent. Here we see that leucine and alanine are number one and two in terms of frequency. So if you were looking for a modification on leucine or alanine, you would really be in for a very long day. But uh, we see that these modifications, uh, that these residues down here, tyrosine, methionine, histidine, cysteine, and tryptophan are much less frequent in the database. As a result, there's a much lower cost to seeking out identifications on these rare amino acids than there is on a very common amino acid. Uh, all right, so let's move ahead. Uh, there are lots of potential modifications you might plausibly look for. If you spend any time visiting the Unimod site, you will see that there are literally hundreds of different post-translational modifications that you can look for. Now I would note that if you haven't actually enriched your sample for a particular modification, the modifications that are most frequent are not actually interesting bio biology, they're really mostly chemical modifications. So you may have, for example, uh, seen a, a set of peptides where instead of having a proton creating a positive ion, you have sodium creating a positive ion. Uh, you, instead of seeing a sodiated ion, you might see a, 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 an ion that bears a, a potassium ion to, to make it positive. These are not informing you anything about the biology, but they are telling. But these are mass shifts that appear in our data sets that masquerade as, as interesting PTMs all the time. So there are lots of different modifications that we might look for. And in fact, by the way you set up the experiment, it might be required that you look for post-translational modifications. Maybe you're using iTrack reagents, for example. iTrack reagents let us measure quantities of proteins across different experiments. So. Uh, if you are looking for, uh, if, you, if you've used iTrack reagents in your samples, you simply must look for iTrack modifications to be able to make any sense of your data. Those are a mass shift of 144 over on the N-terminus of the peptide. So there are, there are plenty of cases where uh, you would be looking for PTMs, even if you haven't, uh, uh, even, even if the biological PTMs are not those in play. Now, this slide is really busy, and it, it makes a lot of different points. Um, we're really going to focus on just one of several messages from here. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at the, uh, these three arrows here, these are comparisons between three ways in which we often search our data. One is a fully triptych search, which means that every peptide must have a triptych cutting site on both ends. You might use a semi-triptych search, where only one end of the peptide is required to be uh, uh, conformed to a trypsin digest point, 
or you might use an unconstrained search where maybe you've used a random cutting enzyme uh, and you really have no prediction about what residues are associated with peptide endpoints. So in this, you can see that the number of comparisons, and it, it, probably the simplest way to look at this is just the amount of time required for the search. Here we had 1,877 seconds for this search, 392 for this one, and 28 for that. So you can see that using enzyme specificity has a huge payoff in terms of how much time is required for a search. Uh, the box I really want to focus on, though, is this one right down here. In this case, We've done the search where we expected the masses of peptides to be accurate within 20 ppm. This is not very conservative. With, a, with an orbitrap, you frequently know the mass of the precursor ions within 10 ppm. But this is allowing for some slop in, in how the instrument behaves. All right, so in this case, we looked for no modifications at all. In this case, we looked for a modification where only a modification of the N-terminus was allowed, and only when there was a glutamine at the, as the N-terminal residue. Here we have methionine being allowed to change to be plus 16. This is oxidation. It's one of the most common modifications that people look for. Uh, and this is a phospho search. Here we're, looking, we're allowing for methionine to gain 16 because it can oxidize, but we're also allowing for serine, threonine, and tyrosine to gain 80 mass units. All right, so these are four different searches, but they have rather different impact on the amount of time taken uh, by the search. Here we had a 28-second search, a 31-second search. So this is a very minimal impact for a, a post-translational modification search. And the reason is that the software only needs to look for the modification if there's a glutamine at the N-terminus. It doesn't matter that a glutamine might be found anywhere else in the sequence. It only cares if it's at the N-terminus. So correspondingly, there's a relatively small growth of the overall search base. But when we add, allow for any methionine found in, in a, any peptide to be considered with or without the oxidation, we see that the impact of the search time is about a 50% increase over our initial search. So that's a, that's a pretty hefty cost. Finally, when we allow for phosphorylation searching, we now have a lot of different modifiable sites all in play at the same time. And we see that our search time is nearly an order of magnitude greater. Let's think about what that looks like in graphical sense. In this, in this uh, diagram, every circle's area reflects the number of candidates that are getting compared to spectra. And we see that our fully triptych search has a relatively small area compared to semi-triptych searching. I tend to think of it as kind of a 10 to 1 thing, that you have 10 times as much search space to consider when you allow for semi-triptych than fully triptych searching. If you allow any uh, enzyme specificity, then you have this large unconstrained search space. And that may, may in fact be just too big. Uh, and here we see the growth required from these, uh, from these post-translational modifications. If we do no modifications, we have a little light blue space. Uh, we have the, the green, uh, the, the magenta space if we allow for oxidation of the thionines only. And we have this larger green space as we go to uh, phospho phosphorylation searching. Now, generally speaking, when we do searches of this sort, we're not using fully triptych consideration. Generally speaking, we're using the semi-triptych consideration. So imagine if you have the same proportional growth off of that larger magenta circle for semi-triptych searching. In this case, both PTMs and enzyme specificity are contributing to how many comparisons we must make, so the searches get a lot slower. Now, sequence tagging is uh, a relatively, well, it's not so new at this point, it's been around for uh, about the last decade, really, but uh, it's using the data of tandem mass spectra a lot more intelligently, giving us a little more discriminating power up front so we don't have to compare uh, every, ion, every possible decorated peptide that just happens to match a precursor mass. It's using the information from the spectrum twice. <clears throat> so typically the first step that we see is tag inference. In this case, we're, we're, uh, the, the sequence tag in the name of the algorithm re reflects the, this, this use of sort of an anchor that's inferred sequence drawn directly from the tandem mass spectrum. So we are going to, the most typical way that we do this is to look for a three residue sequence of amino acids drawn directly from the tandem mass spectra. So the simple way to think about this is that we have a bunch of fragment ions in the spectrum. Some of them are separated by the masses of amino acids. So if you have a, a, a leucine at the seventh position of a peptide, then the, dif the distance between B6 and B7 should be 113 mass units because that's the mass of leucine. So if you look for 
uh, successive pairs of peaks, you may be able to infer a partial sequence directly from the spectrum. So we use some software called DirectTag that we developed in our lab for this purpose. We're still going to make use of the FASTA sequence database, but now the tag-based filter is going to have to do a lot of work because that's what's figuring out which peptide candidates can be compared to these spectra. And it's going to have to do some work to reconcile the differences that it sees between what the database says the spectrum should look like and what the spectrum does look like. We'll talk about that step uh, in a little more detail. Finally, having incorporated what PTMs are needed at the tag-based filter and figured out which sequences are going to get compared, we can predict what those spectra should look like and, comp and compare them to the observed spectrum just as we did in database searching. So there are really four kinds of modes that we've identified for doing this kind of searching. The first of these is the dynamic search. So we want to expand sequences exponentially. We've already talked about what that looks like. The process is no different in sequence tagging than it is in database search. Preferred modifications are kind of a special mode that we put together in our software for reconciling observed spectra to those that are, uh, that are inferred from the sequence database. So in a preferred search, we create what we call a palette of post-translational modifications that are allowable. And the software is told that it, in trying to figure out why a spectrum differs from what the sequence database says it should look like, that it can draw from this palette of modifications to uh, rationalize the difference away. So I give this example down here. Imagine that we have a sequence database entry that says QGDLTAR. That's a triptych peptide for us. And it's here at a nice arginine, and let's say there's a lysine up here at the other side. So this is what the sequence database says the spectrum might look like. What our tag says is that we can infer these three letters, DLT, so aspartic, leucine, three name, those also happen to be my initials, but don't be thrown off by that. Uh, and down here at the other end, we've got the C terminus of the peptide, and the mass that we infer for that is 227. 227 corresponds perfectly with AR. Uh, arginine is 156, uh, alanine is 71, you add those together and you get 227. So that's, that's, that's brilliant for us. So the N-terminus, however, is a mismatch. We have a mass of 168. Uh, glutamine is 128, glycine is 57, that doesn't add up. Or 17 mass units, too high. So one of the things that we might do in a preferred modification search is to say that any time you have, have a glutamine at the N-terminus, it is allowable to, uh, to infer a mass shift of minus 17. That's exactly the same thing as what we were doing a moment ago with what we call the pyroglue uh, mechanism, where the N-terminus loses 17. So if we set it up as a preferred modification, the software can reconcile the inferred information from the spectrum with what's seen in the sequence database by introducing this modification. Now, if there was something uh, like if lysine were at the N-terminus, for example, it's got roughly the same mass as glutamine, but we would not allow lysine to lose 17 because lysine doesn't have access to that chemistry. So this preferred, uh, this preferred palette approach means that we have to inform the software what mass shifts are plausible as opposed to which ones are not. So something like a, uh, a mass shift of 43 from carbamylation is allowable on an internal lysine, for example. That would be the sort of intelligence that we can feed the software. A sodiation rather than a protonation, that's, that is a plausible modification. So we could include those in a palette. And the software can even combine together different modifications to make up these different mass shifts that occur. Now, the mutation mode is something that we thought would be very, very promising in the area of, colon, uh, of, of, of cancer research. Uh, because we, we're, we're always allowing for some possibility that, mod, that, that mutations may be present in these colon, uh, it, it, sorry, we do a lot of colon cancer, uh, in, in these cancer tissues. So uh, in a mutation search, we might work from something like a blossom matrix, which says which amino acids are most likely to be replaced by another in the process of evolution. So we might say that something with a positive score in a blossom matrix is allowable as a mutation, and anything with a negative or a zero score is implausible. Uh, so in that case, we could allow for these substitutions from a sequence database, and a lot of interesting things can happen from that. Now, one of the most common mu uh, mutation mass shifts that we see is a shift of 14. And the reason for this is, the, is, is that 14 is uh, the, the mass difference that you get when you add in basically a methylation on something. 
So imagine that you have a serine in a sequence and you've replaced it with a threonine. Serine to threonine is a mass shift of 14. If you have an aspartate and you replace it with a glutamate, again, your mass shift is 14. So the end effect of using a mutation uh, like this is that you see an awful lot of mass shifts of 14 introduced, uh, explained by these differences. But the kind of search that we're going to talk about next is the blind search. And the blind search is let us say it is a hypothesis forming search. It should never be the last thing that you do. Instead, the blind search is going to allow the software to put in a single modification on any, um, on any single amino acid in a peptide. So this is really a wild and woolly search. It's allowing for us to find um, mutations and modifications of, of all sorts without prior knowledge of what they are. So this is sort of a, what, do they, what can the data inform me of? Uh, when, we, when we apply these searches. The result from a, from a blind modification search looks something like this. We have these columns, and each column represents an amino acid. Obviously, that would keep going until we get to W. Uh, oh, sorry, to, to Y, my bad. Uh, and on the rows, we have a delta mass. So this delta mass says, how much mass do we need to introduce in the middle of this peptide in order to explain the, the difference between the database sequence and the spectrum that we've collected. And what we have in the cells represent the, the, the commonality of that mass shift. So we've, uh, we've mentioned a few times over that methionine tends to oxidize. Oxidation is here at 16 mass units. And as we look across, we see that, sure enough, we have more than 3,000 examples of spectra where a methionine has been oxidized. But we also have some other interesting things. Now, th these data were from uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, and we see that proline also showed a huge amount of oxidation. Now, uh, we, we talked with some of our friends who actually work in extracellular matrix, and they explained to us that there's a very clear uh, der 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 derivation for these modifications, because one of the things that's so common in extracellular matrix is a lot of cross-linking and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the modification, uh, a lot of uh, uh, oxidation in proline. So we, we have something called hydroxyproline that's really common in proteins of the extracellular matrix. So here's something that we can learn from our data where if we'd simply used a database search, we simply wouldn't have identified those spectra, or we would have identified them wrongly. But here, because we're allowing the data to inform us which modifications are present, we suddenly have the ability to pick up information that would have been stepped over if we hadn't allowed for blind search. OK, so blind search is very powerful. But I would note, there's a huge number of mass shifts that we see out there. And it, not all of these are real things. So what we're looking for here are patterns of mass shifts that are very, very common within the data set. Not every one of these needs to be chased down. We're, we're not going to look for a mass shift of 10 on a spartate. There are five spectra for it. These just happen to creep in past our false discovery rates. Because that's the other thing that blind modification searches are renowned for. Huge, huge amounts of error buried in alongside all those, those bits of gold that you'd like to mine from your data. So how can you become expert in blind modification interpretation? Let us start with the maxim that boring is more often correct than brilliant. We were really excited when we looked at those extracellular matrix uh, proteins because when we had run our search, we did it in mutation mode. And in mutation mode, we found uh, a, a world of, of, uh, of mutations that looked really exciting when in fact they were, they were simply experimental artifacts. Uh, things like hydroxyproline can be misinterpreted as another amino acid altogether. Proline does not mutate to become, uh, uh, sorry, to become leucine. That doesn't happen. And yet, in our data sets, we saw lots of evidence that proline had become leucine. That's because we told it to look for mutations, and it interpreted modifications as mutations. That's a dangerous thing to do. So you should always look for all the boring reasons why you might have seen this mass shift, rather than the interesting, brilliant ones. Because if you've got a boring interpretation, that is almost assuredly the one that you should use in trying to make sense of these data. Next, you should use a blind post-translational -trans post modification search to find patterns of mass shifts. You cannot put any faith in an individual peptide spectrum match uh, that happens to show them the, the mass shift you're interested in. And if you are the bioinformaticist working with biologists, it is your job to protect them from their, inst their instincts. 
a biologist is going to go chasing after that thing that you think uh, that 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 one post-translational modification that they that it happens to fall on a protein that they care about so very much, and you need to protect them from that. You need to be really cognizant of what kind of error rates are associated with these searches. So. That you, your last search should not be a blind search. Your last search should use the information gleaned from the blind search to go after it in a more structured way. Next, unusual cleavages are really tricky. If you allow the database search to consider only fully triptych peptides as possibilities, it may be that semi-triptych uh, cleavages, cases where you had maybe an extra protease going on in your sample, or the instrument was charged up a little highly and you were getting in-source fragmentation, can cause non-triptych peptides to appear within your sample. And if your software doesn't know that non-triptych peptides are possible, it may be forced to introduce modifications to explain those peptides. So we have to be really careful about that. Now I've included a little fraction here of the, uh, of the periodic table here. And I, I always want to remind people that when you're looking in, in your, when you're looking in positively charged ions, there are multiple ways to in invoke a positive charge. Sodium ions, calcium ions. So anything in this area, really, you should be thinking about as a possible way that the positive charge appeared on that peptide. These are examples of boring inferences that may save you from making incorrect, uh, brilliant discoveries. Okay, on we go. This is one of the ways that we use in order to cut down our search space when we do these searches. So this is kind of the, the three-level structure that we use. The first step is figure out which proteins actually matter to a sample. When we start with a sequence database like IPI human or RefSeq human, we are we're making sort of a background model assertion about our data. We're saying that the proteins in this sample could be uniformly just uniformly drawn from this uh, from this larger search space from the, the total human proteome. But certainly, not all proteins uh, in the human database are equally likely to appear in a, in a database search. We know this. If you're dealing with human samples, I'll tell you that albumin is a far more likely protein to appear than some protein that appears in only a couple hundred copies in the cell. So one of the first things that we're going to want to do is to cut down our search space to just those proteins that are actually in the sample. If you're searching all 70,000 entries of the current RefSeq human, uh, your search will take a long time, and uh, you, you'll end up searching a lot of proteins that have no relevance at all to your sample. So one of the first things that we would do is to try to cut down our search space to just the proteins that actually appear in the sample. So we'll run a, a, a standard database search strategy to figure out which proteins are there. At the end, we'll export a new sequence database that contains just the proteins that are actually present. And the, the cut down here is really substantial. Maybe you started with 70,000 entries in the RefSeq database, and now you've got a couple thousand at worst case. I mean, that's, that's a pretty substantial cut down in the number of proteins you have to search. Next, we would use our blind search to figure out which palette of modifications is actually of interest to us. So one of the things that we would do is, is to generate one of these cross tables in ID Picker that shows us which mass shifts are associated with which amino acids. And then we would decide, this is a modification we want to know more about. This is a modification we want to know more about. Maybe we'll pull a palette of 10 of them, for example. And at that point, we can use our preferred mode, uh, our preferred, uh, preferred modifications mode in Tag Recon to go looking for just that palette of modifications. Now we've got a much safer set of post-translational modifications that we can draw from, and we have a much better controlled false discovery rate. All right. Now I've already alluded to some of the problems that we encounter in post-translational modification searching. But let's talk a little bit more in detail about the, the problems of site localization and escalated false discovery rates. So uh, it, is, it is clearly the case that there are lots of times when multiple PTM decorations of the same peptide tie in score for a particular spectrum. So we have a, a spectrum, and maybe we have a serine and a threonine that are right next door to each other. And the score for the serine phosphorylation variant is identical to the score for the threonine phosphorylation variant. So that's, that's a problem. Sometimes there's just a little bit of information to try to convince us that one of those modification sites is better than the other site. 
So anytime you're talking about post-translational modifications, you really need to be aware of, of locational ambiguity and, and be able to express that in some meaningful ways. So uh, one of the algorithms that's been put out there that, that's become quite frequent on the ground is this ACE or uh, software that was published by Bosley et al. back in 2006. And in ACE or the software will try all sorts of different positions for the modifications. It'll, it'll use the, uh, the same peptide that was reported by database search. And it'll use exactly the same modifications that were asserted by database search. But now it will try all sorts of different positions within the peptide for that modification. And it will evaluate how much better the scoring position was that, that uh, was asserted by the database search algorithm than these other possible locations. And from, from this, it, it's kind of doing a reanalysis of the spectrum using a lot of different what-if scenarios. What if this mesh shift were here? What if it were there? And the, this distribution of scores is informative in how much more likely the top scoring position was than some of the others that might compete with it. The other approach is to use information that came from the database search algorithm itself. So maybe Sequest reported that the top scoring uh, PTM variant for this peptide puts, uh, puts puts the PTM on this, uh, this, this position. So what were the other scores that it produced? It had other lo localizations of those modifications. And we can ask things like, how much better did the, uh, the top scoring one match than did the second best or the third best? And so again, we're, we're asking about these score distributions as a way to evaluate uh, how confident we are in this localization. Now I'm going to try to spell this out a little more clearly because I realize that this is an important point and, and, and some folks don't spend all day looking at spectra. So let, let's walk through it a little more carefully. Uh, let us imagine, if I actually point on the screen, will that uh, move a pointer on there? We'll give it a whirl. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let us examine these two possibilities. Okay, I'm not getting an arrow or anything, so I'm just going to use the label. Here we have a serine right next to a threonine. Okay. And this, in this, uh, this star represents where we've placed the modification. So in this case, uh, the, the serine is modified, and in this case, the adjacent threonine is modified. One of those will score well, and one of those will score almost as well. How much evidence will we have for one of those positions versus the other? In other words, what, allow, what enables us to tell the difference between these two possible answers? And the answers are shown by the, this, uh, this notation we use to indicate where our fragment lines are. If B6 includes the mass of this phosphorylation, uh, then we know that the, that the phosphorylation must, take, must be on the serine. If B6 does not include the mass of the phosphorylation, then the phosphorylation needs to be on the threonine instead. Similarly, if Y3 does not include the mass of the phosphorylation, then it must be on the serine. If, the, if uh, the Y3 ion does include the mass of the phosphorylation, then we know that it must be on the threonine. So in other words, we have just these two ions that are moving that, that tell us whether which of these two positions is the likely location for the PTM. These are hard to look, these are hard localization problems. And quite frequently, we're simply missing the Y3 and uh, B6 ions, and so we don't have any information to make that, make that judgment upon. As a result, in that case, we would say we can't localize it if on one of these two sites, but we don't know which. Now consider the scenario for uh, this position versus that position. So here we have a, a B6, or a, the sixth amino acid, or the fourth that's modified. On, on, in this case, we have twice as much information to differentiate those two locations because both B4 and B5 would be changed if the position of that modification changes. And in the other case, uh, we see that Y4 or Y5 would move uh, based on whether or not that mass is there. So we may not have that, we, we may have much greater confidence in which peptide is represented and how much mass is born in modifications than we do in where specifically those modifications can be found. And there's also the very unsettling possibility that this peptide may be present in both forms in your data, and because they co-eluded from the column and were co-fragmented, you have fragments from both in a single tandem mass spectrum. In cases like that, it's not really possible to untangle the information about which variant is, the, uh, is, is present. 
Okay, so that's why localization is challenging. The next is false discovery rate escalation. And this is something that I think is not as widely known in our field. Um, all right, so let, let's start with the fact that we almost always control a global false discovery rate at the peptide spectrum match level. This is something that we do in our ID picker software. It's something that people do when they use peptide profit or other tools like that. Uh, as a result, we can apply some threshold that says, overall, the false discovery rate for our peptide spectrum matches is 1% or less. That makes us feel very good about it. And you might erroneously think that means that any spectrum you see has only uh, a 1% chance of falsehood. That if you see a modification variant of some peptide, that you, you can place a great deal of faith in it. However, the more modifiable sites that you have within the, spec, within the peptide sequence, the greater the chance that the software is going to work, the fold, spindle, and mutilate that sequence to force fit it to some spectrum that you've observed. That's the effect. Remember that slide where we showed the huge increase in number of modification variants that, that we were comparing to spectra at high masses? High mass peptides have lots of modifiable sites. As a result, they can be erroneously matched to spectra at a much higher rate. So it's important then to look at empirical false discovery rates for peptides that contain different numbers of PTMs. So here's a data set that we've worked with from Broad Institute uh, using um, breast tumors from the, the TCGA collection that they've been doing as part of CPTAC. We've analyzed, in this case, 468 LCMSMS experiments. And we've used this modification search where we allowed for a plus 80 on serine, threonine, and tyrosine, and we've allowed a plus 16 on the thionines. And we're allowing up to four modifications within a particular peptide. Uh, when we did the search, we controlled our false discovery rate to uh, 1%. So 1% of all of the peptide spectrum matches are expected to be erroneous based on our target equipment. Uh, and we've required two different spectra for every peptide sequence to be found. So this is a pretty conservative way, really, to hold back errors in these pulses in, in, in uh, the spectra. But we have a very large number of spectra because we started from 468 experiments. So we had 316,000 spectra that were identified, and they corresponded to 291,000 variants of peptides. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, two spectra per peptide. The peptide is included both inside or not? Uh, yes, in, in this case, we, we did not take that into account. So if the same peptide were seen in oxidized and non-oxidized form, we would allow that to count. But the software allows you to specify whether you're making that requirement at a match level or at a peptide level. And in ID picker, match means a charge variant or a modification variant. So this is uh, the peptide level. Right, this is all peptide level. Right. Okay, so when we look at the number of peptide, spec uh, peptide variants that we have, these are, uh, this, this, may, this means that we're lumping together things that differ in, in uh, sorry, we're splitting things that differ in charge or the different post translational modifications. So we can ask, what is the false discovery rate for, uh, for, uh, Peptides, uh, for peptide spectrum matches that have no modifications, that have one, that have two, or three, or four, which was the maximum allowed for in the software. What we see is that empirically, our false discovery rate was very well controlled for unmodified and singly modified peptides. But we then see an escalation, a doubling of the error rate as we move from one modification to two on a single peptide. Here we have a, a five-fold jump in the, uh, in the uh, in, the, in the error rate as we go from singly modified to triply modified peptides. And here we have a really 14.1% uh, <coughs> error rate for those, for those peptide spectrum matches that contain four, uh, uh, four modifications. So even though we've controlled the global false discovery rate, the local false discovery rate may be much, much higher as we go to larger numbers of modifications. So this is something that we really have to be cognizant of when we're trying to make sense of these data. When we're looking at phosphorylation searches, if you see, mod uh, if you see a single peptide bearing three or four modifications, it does not have the same chance of error as an unmodified peptide by any chance. So when we summarize, I, I would note that going after post-translational modifications has been a very popular pursuit in proteomics all the way back to 1995. Using database search engines is far and away the most common way that people do this kind of searching. Um, 
However, as we've seen, as we start adding larger numbers of modifications to our searches, the speed will really drop because the number of comparisons that we must do grows. Blind search is very valuable if you're trying to figure out which modifications you should be searching for in a data-directed way. The data can inform us which modifications are most common in that set. But it really has to be said that software can help you, and there are systems out there like expert learning systems, machine learning systems, that can dig through PTMs and find those that are most likely and so on. Software may be of assistance, but your eyes and critical thinking are your biggest assets. Anytime you see a post-translational modification that's been, uh, that's been published or something, before you go jumping after it, just because it made it through peer review does not mean it's real. Trust me on this one. The first thing I do when I'm making sense of somebody else's data that's been published is to throw out their article, grab their raw data, and reprocess it. Take that, take that as a note to the wary. So if you see that someone has published a post-translational modification, think about all of the simpler explanations that you can possibly come up with to explain that PTM before you start hunting after it yourself. PTMs are notorious for false discovery, uh, for, for, uh, for er erroneous uh, identification. You've got to be extremely careful when you are publishing them or when you're interpreting them from somebody else's work. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate your coming out today. I, I realize the snow may come any minute. <laughs> We might have time for one or two questions to the speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, you see the thought about the identification model, today, but uh, I have a question about the quantification actually about the PTM. Uh, so there is a peptide quantification and the protein quantification, but how do you think about the site quantification? Uh, about site uh, about site